Tonight's presentation is um, Not a Victim, Tales of Survival in Nazi Budapest. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we should be very grateful to have Mr. Weishaus here tonight. Uh, he's going to talk about racism uh, and it never ends, as you all know. It's happening everywhere in the world as we speak. Um, people are being you know, displaced from their countries yeah, for one reason or another. And it's really a discussion or sharing of tales which are tragic and some joyful about loss. And this month is in memory of Holocaust, the Holocaust which is uh, unfathomable. Um, many of us here are, um, have been victims, perhaps, in our ancestors, people who came to Newmarket in our own community from other places and were referred to as the other. In fact, John Carmichael, our archivist, said to me a few weeks ago, uh, when a crime was committed in Newmarket, if the person was of French blood, meaning a Quebecois from Quebec, he was not referred to as a person, but as a Frenchman. In other words, the other, the stranger. Uh, this is profound, and we need to hear about it, talk about it, and weep for the past, and also to, you know, continue to live um, honoring the memory of, of, of people who have suffered because they were different. So without further ado, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very honored and pleased to have Tom Weishaus here to talk to us. Thank you. Um, I, uh, want to correct something immediately. I am not here to... I, I have not come here to review the, uh, the facts about the Holocaust that you already heard from here to there for how many years now? The six million, Auschwitz, the million and a half children of whom, uh, uh, out of six million, there were one and a half million children. And uh, the Nazis made it clear that they would kill the children first in all the communities that they got into. Uh, I'm not going to review things that you've heard many, so much that it's up to here. Uh, and uh, I have a lot more important things to say. Number one, I'd like to say something about the fact that Hitler Hitler and his Nazis, who were basically cheap criminals uh, who failed at uh, Is that our sound here? No, that's an airplane. Okay. Oh, by the way, I'd like to remark before I say anything else, I'm really impressed with the historical realities uh, that this room seems to be filled with. Uh, very impressive. Uh, the, the maps and the people and all of that. I, I didn't realize. And, and the building itself with the stones from the outside, uh, we were immediately aware of that. That's the kind of thing you don't see very much anymore. But uh, I'm here to, um, to, to set the record sta straight in some ways uh, without ever implying that I am not, uh, you know, devastated and, and, and mournful about what happened to the Jews of Europe because of uh, the Nazis. I'm obviously aware of all of that, and, uh, <coughs> me. and, and I'm, I've had to live with it. I lost my mother, my grandmother, an aunt, and a cousin in one fell swoop uh, at the very end of the war, at the end of December 1944, in Budapest. And uh, so I had my losses, and I, I've done my mourning, and, but I want to rec set the records st straight that very few people seem to be aware of. Uh, I think Hitler is uh, constantly being given posthumous victories by, uh, 
by people who are survivors or who are speaking for survivors. And by the posthumous victories, I mean that he is being given, Hitler and his, his Nazi thugs are being given credit for destroying a, a people uh, as if they had been a people, number one. The Jews were a, a completely defenseless minority in all the countries of Europe. And in all of the countries of Europe, they had been the, perhaps as, as uh, patriotic as, as any native member of those countries. For instance, in Germany, <coughs> there had been 14, 12 to 14,000 Jewish deaths in the First World War, many of them officers who fought for Germany in the First World War. And uh, they remained a, a minority that uh, a certain group in Germany could, uh, could, could start to destroy when, when the time came, when it was desperate enough in the German economy. But the point I'm trying to make is that the German uh, Nazis and, and Hitler if, if rightly seen, but they have not been rightly seen, only a couple of authors here and there refer to this. But if they are rightly seen, you can see that they were basically unsuccessful criminals. They were unsuccessful in the criminal uh, activity that they, sh they should have worked harder to become successful at, which is stealing. They wanted to steal the, the wealth of those people among them who had worked very hard to create businesses, uh, banks, because they weren't allowed to own land. The Jews were not allowed to own land for hundreds of years. And so they had to go into businesses like selling uh, liquor, uh, pubs, they had to uh, become bankers, they had to become businessmen and so forth, and a very small minority to keep life together, to be able to eat. So, so the Jews uh, were there to, uh, as an easy pickings for a population of peasants who didn't want to get educated, who didn't want to become clever uh, thieves. A, a clever thief, he works his way into the second floor of a home that he wants to steal from and, and he, he disappears with the, with the goods that he wants to take. He doesn't have to kill people in order to steal. The Germans were so unsuccessful at being clever that they had to kill the people that, uh, that created the wealth uh, in Germany. And by the way, uh, just to make sure that I don't miss out on this, uh, it's something that very few people seem to have followed up on, and that is what the most respected philosopher in Germany, in the history of Germany, and that's Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, whom uh, the Nazis tried to, uh, tried to make into a part of their family <laughs> by saying that he had preached against the Jews, and it's just the opposite. Nietzsche... <coughs> In so many words, if you read Beyond Good and Evil, he says the Jews are the best people of Europe. Why? Because they have no nationalism in their blood. They don't destroy other countries to get something for themselves. This is Nietzsche who said that. And, 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 and these low-life low thieves that Hitler's group was made up of, they tried to make the German people believe that Nietzsche was the spokesman for Nazism. And it was only his sister who took some of his, uh, I mean Nietzsche's sister, who took some of his texts and actually rewrote some of the stuff that Nietzsche had written because she was a, an anti-Semite and she was trying to make Nietzsche into something that he wasn't. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, re, uh, let's say, improve the record. That's what I'm trying to do here. And I'm assuming that I'm talking to an educated audience uh, who, who know what the, uh, what the Germans had said about the Jews and what uh, historians have covered in books about the Jews and about the Holocaust and all that. And, and, and I'm tired of, of uh, hearing uh, unfortunate, tragically sad cases of survivors trying to present what the Holocaust was about, which was about six billion people killed, about Auschwitz, about all the other camps and all the other gas, uh, gassings and uh, crematoria and that kind of thing. When I think there's another story to be told, the story is the story of the Jews. And the story of the Jews is that they are here. They are not only the fact that they have Israel, that they have a country, 
But the fact that they have survived the greatest, perhaps the greatest <coughs> attack on, on any people in the history of mankind. And they have survived it not only uh, like poor little survivors who end up on the street collecting, asking for pennies from people. Uh, the Jews, <laughs> the Jews sent three or four physicists uh, to this country between 1936 and 1940. These were physicists who were actually brought up in Hungary, but uh, finished their education in German universities. And then when Hitler came along and uh, it was, became clear what, what the Hitlerites were after, uh, these uh, physicists came to this country, settled down at the University of Chicago, and the names are like uh, Enrico Fermi who was from, from uh, uh, Italy, but the other three uh, that I, I can mention, and you can look this up in a book that was written called The Great Escapes uh, by uh, Kati Martin, K-A-T-I, Martin, M-A-R-T-O-N. She was the second wife of uh, that Canadian broadcaster on Channel 7, uh, Peter Jennings. She was his second wife. She published a book called Great Escapes, and she tells the story of what these physicists uh, did to, to Hitler and to the Nazis and to their dream of ruling the world because they were already aware of what the German physicists were working on with their heavy water research, etc., etc. They were trying to develop, of course, the uh, atomic fission and, and uh, uh, the, the kind of thing that was going to lead to uh, the bomb. And so when they came to this country and they started to work at the University of Chicago and they agreed that the danger is great, especially because they were getting letters from German physicists who were friends of theirs, they went to Einstein, who was at that point working in Princeton, and they showed him a letter that they were going to send to FDR, and Einstein signed it happily because it was telling FDR that the, the G German danger of, of a bomb is such that America has to get to work. And you've all heard of the Manhattan Project. Now, FDR was uh, somewhat busy with the cocktails that he was drinking at the time and with uh, the political uh, victories that he was gaining all the time. He didn't worry too much, so he put the letter on his table and he left it on his desk for a while. And finally, somebody found it and showed it to him, and it told him that you had better get to work. There's this grave danger developing in Germany. And so they established the Manhattan Project out in Los Alamos and then in, uh, in, at the University of Chicago. And as you remember the facts, we came up with Obama, and that's because of three or four Jewish <laughs> physicists who came to this country to do to Hitler what they couldn't do to him at home. And uh, to me, this is a, uh, uh, it, it, it's a wonderful kind of uh, trump, trump card in the game. Because uh, without, without that, the Germans and the Japanese would have had the bomb. Do you know where we would be now? <laughs> uh, I will just say that uh, aside from that, uh, if you look at uh, if you look at the rest of just just uh, the facts of world history, there would be no Western civilization without the Jewish values that have gone into the writings of prophets ever since the age of Moses, very from the very beginning. The very first thing, the the, the Ten Commandments, was a revolutionary document. Everyone thinks of it as as vanilla ice cream. Well, you know, after all, do not thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not. Everybody accepts that, that's, that, that those cliches, you know. No one pays attention anymore to them. But the first, those, those, ten, those ten statements were revolutionary when you consider that even the Jews, <laughs> by the time Moses came down from the mountain, they were already fornicating around the statue of Baal, the, uh, the, the golden calf, and dancing. <laughs> and, and the Jews, uh, we're guilty of the same behavior that the, the, the Ten Commandments were about. And so it was a, you had to change. That was a change for people. And change is painful. And change makes you angry. And, and there was much fighting against the Ten Commandments. But that was just the beginning. 
the Jews brought into the world prophets like Isaiah, like uh, you name it. I mean, go through the whole the whole Torah, the the, uh, the uh, Torah, but the Bible, mm -hmm. and it's it's one it's one Jewish prophet after another explaining what life is about. Not to mention when the greatest Jewish prophet Jesus came to the world, who who put into words. Uh, what the Jews had said, which was to treat your fellow men the way, certainly as well as you would be treated, but better. Because the way you treat yourself is not, not always nice. Uh, but, uh, but, but Jesus wanted the brotherhood of man. And, and unhappily, he had to be punished in the worst possible way for such a radical idea. And, but it went on from there. Empire after empire came after the Jewish people. Just take Egypt, and, and then Assyria, and take Babylon, and take any of the empires that, that, that conquered the Jews, and took them into, into captivity in Babylon, or when they were captives in Egypt. All of those things to survive, and yet leave to the world a, uh, a, 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 a set of principles by which the Western world today would not be what it is. The basic, the basic principles of the world today, the ethical principles of, of helping the poor, of, of being on the side of the underdog. I'll tell you a story from the Bible. The God, the, the Jewish God, had that, that there was one uh, element that you have to hear about. This is a, uh, a holiday for the Jews for the harvest. They, they celebrate the harvest, it's called Shavuot. And God has this passage in the Bible. It says, when you go out on the night of Shavuot and gather your goods from your field, whatever you have your, out there, carrots and lettuce and tomatoes or whatever you make your salads with. <laughs> and he says, he says to the Jews, don't, don't bring in everything. On the edges, the, the uh, the, the gleanings, there are, there are goods to be left there. Why? Because, and here, I cannot talk about this very, very easily. Believe me, because I, I'm in that place. He, God said to the Jew, there will be a stranger that night when you are gathering your goods. A stranger will come along alone, without food, and you are responsible to see to it that he can pick up those gleanings. That stranger shouldn't be alone and shouldn't be hungry. This is an order from God to the Jews. It's not like it's not like saying be philanthropic, you know. Phil philanthropy went with the Greeks, it went with the Romans. They they were allowed, they were allowed to take care of the poor. But the Jewish God ordered the Jews to take care of the poor, of the stranger alone. <laughs> And not only that, he, he also told them that there should be no, no name attached to it when you give. You have to be on the side of the underdog, but without a name. I remember being a boy, you know, in Hungary when I was in the choir. I had to be at every service. And there were services when the rich men of the community, of Jewish community, would come into our synagogue of the school that I was going to. And they would step up to this uh, platform where the Torah was spread out for them to read and they would at that time make donations to the Jewish community and uh, they, their name would not only be announced that would be on a program already printed and they were dressed to the nines and we in the choir I was a singer so I, I, I was in the school and we had to kill time to go through all this nonsense of people getting up there and talking about how much money they wanted to give to the community. But we in the choir had, had more fun than they had because we bet based on what kind of tie they had on, what, how, how they were dressed. And we bet on how much they would give. And there were winners in the choir. You could win. You could really win. And you could really have fun while all that nonsense was going on. But the main thing, I'm, the main point I'm trying to make is that the only legal system in the universe, in history, that has a bias towards the poor, the underdog, is the Jewish legal system. Please, 
absorb that. There's no other system that takes the side of the underdog. And I mean systematically. No other system that cares what happens to the underdog. Need I say what that does for Western civilization, what it has done for us? I don't have to tell you. So this is the people that Hitler wanted to destroy, and he spelled out what he wanted, why he wanted to do it. There was a man that took notes at Hitler's dinners in the bunker, okay? And uh, a British uh, philosopher called Trevor Roper published a book about this thing of the notes that this fellow took at the conversations that Hitler had with uh, guests. And one time, he had clergymen at his table. And the discussion raged all over the place. And at one point, one of the clergymen had the guts to say to him, uh, what, what do you have against the Jews? What's the, why? why? Why the Jews? A clergyman said this to Hitler. And Hitler had no, no hesitation. He said, they must be punished because they invented conscience. I forget what the German word for conscience was, but that's what he said. They have to be punished because of inventing conscience. And when I tell that story in a fifth grade class in New Hampshire, as I have been, or seventh or eighth grade, the, some of the kids out, laugh, laugh out loud. They realize what a joke that, that is on Hitler. To, to blame the Jews for inventing conscience. <laughs> How much more credit can you give them? And what would, this, what would this world be like if we had no concept of the conscience? And I ask kids, explain to the class what you understand by conscience. And, and there's always a kid who is sweet and, and smart and he can, he can really put it into words about right and wrong and knowing it and living, living it and all of that. And for that, he wanted to destroy the Jews. <laughs> now, the Jews were not without fault. And, and they were not without people who, who were without conscience. But to be given that kind of credit by their greatest enemy, you, you couldn't have a bigger favor done. And, and that's, that's how I, I take care of Hitler. Now, he failed at everything that he ever tried, including painting in, in Vienna. And he tried a Jewish, uh, a, a Jewish dealer. Uh, to take care of his paintings, and uh, he tried. And this Jew actually tried to, to sell the paintings of Hitler. <laughs> and he couldn't do anything. So um, he failed at that, and he failed at the restaurant. I don't have to tell you. And at the end, when he wanted to have himself burned in the backyard of the bunker, you remember? First he was shot, and then they, he said, burn my body. I don't want my body out for, uh, you know, exhibition. And then, then, the Third Reich didn't have enough gas to burn it. To me, that's the, finals, the, the final word. The Third Reich, <laughs> that was going to be there for a thousand years, didn't have enough gas <laughs> to burn him completely. They, they tried, but they couldn't find enough gas. Need I say, I mean, I'd like to, I mean, I, I, I do want to see him as funny. And I, I see the whole German project as funny. You know, it, it's, it's, it, I, I, cannot, I cannot do justice to them without laughing at them. Uh, there are other things that uh, I want to tell you about tonight. I, I don't know how much time I have. As long as you need. As long as I need. Yes. Well, I, I have a couple of jokes. Uh, <laughs> one joke is, uh, is, is about, uh, let's see, about coming into uh, the point of leaving Germany. After the war, I, I escaped to Germany with a kibbutz that was going to go to Israel, and that's the only place I, can, I could imagine going to, because I wanted to get off the, the European mainland. I didn't want, one thing I didn't want to do, I had no relatives left to talk to, and I had, I had just to myself, I, I said, I, I'm not going to live on the European land, period. There's something rotten here that I don't want to be in touch with forever. So I, I found a kibbutz that was forming, that was going to go to Germany, and then they were, now, at this point, I want to change this whole thing into a farce. Uh, I have a book here that I published. It's called Not a Victim. As you can tell, even in the title, I'm trying to say, 
uh, instead of say, talking about victims, I want to talk about not a victim. And yet, it is about tales of survival in Nazi Budapest, okay? And that picture is of Danube River, and the shoes that you see along here, I was going to show you how they came about, but the film is not working. It is now. You can work it? Yeah, whenever you're ready. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll play it at the end. All right. Thanks anyway. to Rich. Thanks to Rich. Uh, okay. Uh, so anyway, I published this book, and uh, during some of the uh, talks that I'm giving in schools, and I'm going to treat you like you're seventh or eighth graders, okay? And that's what I meant. It's, a kind of, it's going to be kind of a funny thing. Uh, you can win a book with my, sig uh, my signature on the front page. I'm going to sign it for you, okay? You can win it, just like in Oprah. <laughs> um, if you come up with the right answer um, after I get through with the following part of the story. Okay, I went to Germany to wait uh, with the kibbutz until we could sail to Israel. And uh, the, the British uh, came up in 1946 with the rule that they were not going to have any more refugees go to Israel because there was too much fighting going on between the Arabs and the refugees, and the Jewish refugees. And so they stopped the shipping, okay, out of Marseille. And, uh, and so we had to wait in Germany. It, it, it looked like, uh, it looked like, where am I gonna go, you know? Uh, guess what? I mean, I've been able to describe, I've been asked to describe my life, you know, what happened to you? How come that you're still here? Yeah. You're in your 80s. You were in, in the middle of the Nazi uh, European thing, and, and here you are at 80, you're still talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how can I explain that that, 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 that happened? I'll, I'll tell you what, it's a combination of luck and a combination of women. Women. <laughs> dear, dear, lovely, sweet, blessed women. <clears throat> they, I, I have, I have several women that I could, I, I have pictures of them in here, okay, who are responsible for, for my being here. It's not that the men didn't care, it's, too, it's that they were killed before they had a chance to help me. I mean, so I'm not blaming them, you know. My father was taken away in 1942 to the Ukraine and, and made to live there without food and without shelter and so forth. And you know what the Ukraine is like in November and then December and then January. Those of you who have traveled, you know what it's all about in the Ukraine. So, but the women, they, they were there and, and, and they showed such beautiful, sweet courage. Anyway, uh, we were waiting in Germany to, as to, see, to see what will happen now that we can't go to Israel. And guess what? Within a week, I'm away from uh, the camp, the, 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 the displaced persons camp where I was living. I'm away from there and I get a phone call, come back here because there's a, there's an application for a passport. The, the American Congress has passed a law that said that if you're under 18 and you're an orphan of the Holocaust because of the Holocaust, you can apply for an American passport. And you dummy, you're fooling around with a girl 20 miles away. And, and I got on the plane, uh, on, on the train, the first train that I it was down the Danube and I had to get back to Leipheim. And so I caught the first train that I could. I got back in time, I sat down at this table in the uh, United Nations uh, office, okay, and that was the passport, and I started to fill it out. And everything was going well, until this very uh, hoity-toity kind of a, a, a French lady from Paris, <laughs> Madame <laughs> Delarbre was her name, uh, and she worked for the UN as, an, as a volunteer. A lot of volunteers came from the aristocratic class, and she was one of them. She came from Paris, and she saw me working, and she said, here, give me the pen, she said. Uh, I'll do it. You, you don't know how to write. I don't know how to write. Yeah, okay. So anyway, she took the pen from my hand and sat down and started to fill out the application. And when it came to my birthday, I told her, March 7, 1928. That's when I was born. My mother always celebrated one day, March 7. And so she started to write, but she used Roman numerals. And so she was going to write three straight lines for March and then seven, and then 1928. But when she put the first two lines, they turned out to cross each other. They became an X. I said, wait a minute, that, that's, that's November you've got there. You know, the X plus one. Oh, okay, I'll get it. You know. and, and so she went back to it and worked on it. And by the time the, uh, 
passport application came out of her hand and was handed on to the secretary to take it into the, uh, the, the director of the camp, it had the X plus two straight lines. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, wait, this is going to December. Oh, shut up, get, get away from me. It's none of your business, you know. And, and so that's how my application went in. I got the birthday of December 7, 1928. That became my official birthday. When I came to this country, and I got my naturalization papers. It was December 7, 1928. When my wife and I got married, it was December 7. I, everywhere, December 7. <laughs> what was I supposed to do? I said to the secretary of the consul's office in Munich, you've got the wrong number up here, and this is not my birthday. She said, what? She said, do you want me to change every, every document in Washington, DC, where you are a file now with December 7? You know how long that will take? And she was really trying to be kind to me because she said, you will never get to America, I can tell you that. Because, because that application will never be finished. And so I ended up with December 7th. Okay, now that is an interruption to the story that I was gonna tell you about winning this book. Uh, and I'll get back to finishing the story of the birthdays in a, just a minute. But at the time, when uh, we found out that we couldn't uh, go to Israel, it, this, this thing came along, I ended up coming to America. How lucky can you get, you know? And uh, we came to America, we left uh, Bremershaven on December 17, 1946, and we arrived in New York in the, in the, on the Hudson River on January 7, and at uh, the 23rd Street Pier, uh, we were sailing up to Hudson. I have to tell you a little story here that, that, that interferes, but that's just, just for jokes. Uh, we were sailing up to Hudson, and if you have been to Manhattan, you know that there is the West Side Highway that runs all along Manhattan, north-south, uh, and that you can see parts of it when the, when the uh, uh, buildings are interrupted and the streets cut into the highway, and you can see the cars rushing by, right? And here are the Central European kids like me, they're Czechs, they're Romanians, <coughs> Hungarians, Poles, everything. We, we stood together and watching this unbelievable sight. Can you imagine seeing Manhattan for the first time after a war like that? And seeing those buildings and seeing those cars rushing by? And the one thing that caught the eye of all those Central European kids is the yellow. How many yellow cars the Americans like? <laughs> <laughs> And there was nobody to explain it to them except me. I told them they were ambulances. <laughs> I, I told them that there's nothing, there's nothing to be surprised about. If you've seen enough American movies, you know how much shooting is going on. <laughs> that New York is one of the worst. <laughs> and that all those ambulances are going to hospitals with people who have been shot. <laughs> And that's where the animal, that, that's where the yellow comes from. And I don't have to tell you that I didn't seek out their company afterwards. <laughs> we landed. I think they found out what, what really happened. Anyway, we, we arrived at the uh, pier and they, they told us that there were too many of us to be put into one hotel, so we were divided up among the hotels of Manhattan. And they took me, and on my first day in Manhattan, they said, the subway is this way, and I, we want you to take this subway up to 96th Street and then get off and walk seven blocks to 103rd Street, turn left, and there's a hotel. You can look <laughs> up to, at the market and you'll see the name of it. And that, that hotel is where you have been registered. They explained it to me in English. I knew a little English, but I understood pretty well what they wanted. And so on my first day in Manhattan, I was on the, on the IRT subway going through Times Square and, and all the rest of it on a subway and so forth. You didn't and, take the evidence? Then? I had no problem. No, by that time the ambulance people were scattered. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I never needed one. So anyway, I ended up at 96th Street. I got off and I walked seven blocks just like they told me. And then I came to 103rd Street. I turned west, okay? And I looked up and on the marquee, there was the name of the hotel that they told me. And you know what? If you can tell me the name of that hotel from the story that I have told you, there was one word that I used once. I made it very tough because I 
If it's a fifth grade class, I use it several times. But for you, I use the word only once. The name of that hotel on 103rd Street. And if you, if you live on 103rd Street, it's unfair. You, 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 you cannot participate. Okay. And so there was that hotel, and I called out loud in Hungarian. I said, I made it! And I told a class of kids that it, that was my, my reaction. And this little blonde girl in the front seat, she puts her hand up and, you know, that she knows the answer. And I said, go ahead. She said, I made it! <laughs> she, she thought that was the name of the hotel. <laughs> hotel Israel. What? Hotel Israel. You, Israel? Yeah. Uh, we passed. That was a little early. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was before the became a state. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, and, it's, and it's not Budapest. No, it, it, it's another word. Something I mentioned. And if, if you can, if you can come up with the name of that hotel, I'm going to sign this book for you. And remember that my signature will be wor worth more in the future, uh, <laughs> depending on how many books I have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, you stop laughing. Okay. <laughs> yes. Daniel? 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 That's, a, that's a good idea, but it's not. <laughs> no, Manhattan doesn't have it uh, that I know of. There is another name that I mentioned. Budapest. That's the one that this gentleman wanted to try, but uh, it's not that. Mm -hmm. That would be a good one, but... Uh, we'll tell Manhattan. Uh, okay. we'll, we'll tell, tell Manhattan. Palestine. Yeah, Man Manhattan would be very logical, but it's not. <laughs> There's another word that I mentioned, uh, that I mentioned only once, and I'm sorry, I made it very tough. <laughs> because I mentioned only the once. Hudson the what? Hudson? The Hudson. That's another good guess, but it's not. That's the 97th Street. <laughs> no, that's the Paris. <laughs> Hotel Palestine. Palestine. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Anything? Any other guesses? Marquis. Did Who? you say Marquis? Oh, Marquis. There's somebody that always picks Marquis. It's, <laughs> it should be. It's a very popular name for hotels, but it's, right. that, that one was not Marquis. <laughs> but I'll say Bre this. Bremerhaven. What? Bremerhaven. Bremerhaven. No. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not going to let you fail, so I'm going to say Marquis came close. Marseille? Who? Marseille? You got it. <laughs> Marseille. I mentioned it only once. Only because of a woman. Marseille. And your name is? Helen. Helen? Mm -hmm. And it's enough if I say it to help. It's my dear beloved Helen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add that, I'll add that in, in Hungarian. <laughs> I'm so glad that somebody got it. That's why. The Bloomingdale Music School is there. But at least I never knew the hotel. There was a hotel there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's the way it goes. So uh, this is how I kill time when I go out and give lectures about the Holocaust instead of uh, instead of breaking down. The, like I saw that poor woman at the uh, Portsmouth Synagogue. She was sitting next to me, and she is a survivor of Auschwitz. She actually got out of Auschwitz. She was sitting next to me, and she was trying to tell people how she, how she got through, and she couldn't finish the second sentence. She was so moved by talking about it. And that's what I mean, that I'm trying to break away from, from that, and I, I'm trying to make people realize, you know, there's so much to be proud of when it comes to being Jewish. I, I realize that there are not too many Jews here, and please don't throw anything. But, but there is a, a lot to be, there's a lot to be, a lot to be proud of. It's amazing what the Jews have accomplished throughout the ages. And, and there's a story by uh, Borges, Jorge Luis Borges. I'm sure that you've read stories by him. You know him from South America and, and so forth. And he wrote, he wrote a story once in which uh, he, he wanted to accomplish a certain thing. He said, he, uh, these people have someone who says he has a time machine and they can get into it and travel and, uh, and it'll be a very interesting experience. So they get into a time machine and the time machine is turned on and they travel into the, but before the travel begins, he says to this group of people, look, I want you to think of a country today or a society, or a group of uh, people who are living together like a society. 
who, in your opinion, have the least, the least chance to survive into the future. Okay? So think of a think of a country or a society or a group of whatever that have the least chance to survive into the future. Keep it to yourself, don't give it away. This is the beginning of the story. And so they get into the time machine and everyone has fixed in his mind something that he thinks will not survive a, a society. And they get into the time machine and they start traveling. They go 5,000 years into the future, okay? And we, t today we know that these things happen all the time because we are living in an age in which everything is possible. So they're 5,000 years into the future and the, the machine stops, they get off, they come to this tremendous huge lobby of some kind and it's full of newspapers and people rush around picking up the papers and see, see if, if, they, if which of them is right that, uh, that, that their, uh, their pick uh, didn't survive because if, you know, if they're mentioned in the paper, then they have survived. So they keep looking and they can't find, they can't find the US, they can't find China, they can't find uh, Russia, they can't find Germany, they cannot find any country that they have thought of somehow that would be a possibility for them. But they're all gone, there's not one. Finally, one person throws his hand up somewhere in a corner, he's on page 19, and there's a paragraph at the bottom of the page and guess what? It's Israel. 5,000 years later, Israel is the only one. And so at that point, I say to the class of 6th, 7th, 8th graders, what do you think this story is really about? What, what, what is it saying? And once in a while, there will be a, a boy, a girl, who will say, put her hand up or something and say, it's about the history of the Jews. Because 5,000 years ago when they, were, when they were captives in Egypt and then captives of the Assyrians and captives of the Babylonians and so forth and, and they had no chance to survive, they are the ones that you would have picked. And here they are. There's nobody like it. No other, no other culture or civilization survived the same way, that way. And so I tell that story because because to me that summarizes so much, and uh, and I have a lot to summarize because the film that I'm going to show you is just an example of what happened to the people that I love the most: my mother, my grandmother, a cousin who was 16 years old. Her name was Judy, and her mother Olga, who was an aunt of mine, one of three people: my mother and two aunts, and she was a victim in that in that time. And this is. This film describes what happened to them in the last few days of 1944, right around Christmas, because of Nazis who were living in Hungary, and these were Hungarian Nazis who were, who were out to kill whoever they could find. And so I have a film here that was made recently by young Hungarian filmmakers. And by the way, these shoes that you can see on the front page of my book these shoes along the Danube River, maybe you can see uh, the whole line of shoes here. These are made of bronze, made of other metals by a, a, a young sculptor who about five years ago decided to make sure that there's a memorial to what happened on the Danube River in those last days. And he, you, today you can walk along the Danube for about three or four hundred yards and it's all, all these kinds of shoes made of bronze to survive in snow and ice and everything else, okay? And by the way, I gave my speech in a place called Belmont in New Hampshire. How many people know where Belmont is? You all know about Belmont. Okay, there was a school there that invited me, and I, I, I showed them the picture. And guess what? I asked the teacher to, to have the kids write me uh, a reaction to what I had to say. And so I got back a large envelope that was full of papers from the kids, but with two pictures. One picture, I, can't, I don't know if I can talk about it, I'm so emotional. One picture shows a little girl with a laundry basket full of shoes. The other one, a little boy, putting shoes down at the edge of the sidewalk. And, and the picture shows the length of the shoes that have been put down. 
And they, the only thing they knew was this, this memorial. And then there was another picture, aside from the, with the two kids, that had no kids in it, but had a, a, the lengthy, kind of a lengthy shot of a street that already had shoes on one side of the street. In Belmont, in New Hampshire, what did they know about, about what happened? But those kids, they, they identified. And, this, and you can see this in Belmont today. In another school in Stratham, perhaps you know Stratham, that's right next to Exeter. There's a, there's a school there. I had a chance to talk to those kids and they came up with a different kind of identification, which you can look at today if you go into Exeter. Next to the library, there's a green expanse. And in the middle of this green expanse, there's a little garden called, that they called the Butterfly Garden. And it is dedicated to Raoul Wallenberg. And Raoul Wallenberg is a hero of the story that took place in Budapest. He saved thousands and thousands of people. I told them about it. And then they wrote me a letter. The class, the whole class together wrote me a letter. But they wanted to make sure that intolerance and, and lack of love will, will, not, will, will not stay in the world. That they are going to fight against it. And that they will put together a butterfly garden and call it butterflies because to them, butterflies symbolize peace and love. And so that's what it is now. You can see the, the things that they have planted and that they have dug. And they're going to put a, a large granite rock into the middle of this garden. And on it, there will be a plaque that will be dedicated to Raoul Wallenberg. And somewhere along the line, me, they're going to put me on it. Mm -hmm because they want this to survive. These are New, New Hampshire children. These are not New York City children. New Hampshire, small town. I couldn't believe it. I, I, I didn't know what to do with this, but I had to tell you about it because, because you see, that's, to me, that's what gives me hope. And that's why, I, that's why I want to talk about that aspect of it, the survival. And it's more than just survival. So at this point, I'd like you to see that film, because that shows what happened.
by young Hungarian filmmakers recently because they wanted to have a record of something that they knew happened and how it happened. And that's where the shoes come from. That's why they are out there now. It's a memorial that was opened about four, year, four or five years ago. You can go to Budapest now and see all the people that are sitting there watching the shoes. A couple of years ago, I was in Denver on the North on Holocaust Memorial Day time, and many of the synagogues and also many of the churches were doing ecumenical activities of collecting shoes from the congregants and laying them down in the hallways of the rectories and in the hallways of the community centers and the hallways of the synagogues. I've never heard that before. Out of curiosity, can you tell me what Budapest was like before the Nazis came in? What Budapest was like? Yeah. Uh, many people, because of the distance to Budapest, it, it's, it goes beyond Vienna and so forth, uh, they have no real idea about Budapest because uh, uh, there's Paris and Berlin and London and you know Vienna and Madrid, and so Budapest gets left out. But Budapest was a uh, uh, a, a central European kind of Paris in terms of what it offered. And if you go to Hollywood and, and count the number of Hungarian directors <coughs> who made big hits, like Casablanca, that was made by a Hungarian director. And uh, I could give you a few other uh, movies like that. They have one studio that has a sign up, and I, I was only, I didn't see it, but I was told it's up there. It says, it's not enough to be a Hungarian, you have to have talent too. <laughs> there are that many Hungarians working in the movie industry, and, and they work everywhere. The five greatest photographers <coughs> of the war years and, plot, and in the following years were Hungarian Jews, including Robert Kappa, right, who died in the war, who was shot among the American soldiers. And you, you can go down the line how many of the town. So Budapest was a creator of very strong talents. It's a, it's a creative city. I lived in it as a boy. I grew up in it and uh, up to the age of 16, I, that, that's where I was. So I can tell you, it also pulled no punches when it came to growing up. I was by the t 13 or 14 years of age, I was a grown man. You, you learn a lot in a city like that, very quickly. And, you know, and there's a great, a great schools. There's one thing more I need to add, and that's uh, my son called me. Uh, he joined the Israel Defense Force just recently. And he called from Israel last night because, you know, Shavuot, which just ended 15 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, he just wanted to pass on that uh, on his tours when he got a weekend off. He went through a cemetery in Israel, I think in Jerusalem, whatever, and it was, uh, uh, he read the names of uh, seven Hungarian paratrooper Jews. He said that some Hungarians were able to escape. They left, they, uh, uh, there was the Hungarian force, and they later paratroopered into Wherever it he was, was talking about something that happened during the war, during, during the war, near, near the end right. of the war. So there, was a hung, there was a Hungarian girl that was the leader of that group. I, I think I. Her, her name is her. Her her name is definitely uh, recorded and uh, is, is is an outstanding name. So here's my son in Israel. We decided to make Aliyah. Tell me about the Hungarian Jews that I did not know about. The Hungarians are overlooked in general, and Budapest is overlooked. And you know, if you like good food, I you know now I sound like uh, somebody who might uh, say the same thing about Prague or Vienna or you you name it. But Budapest is is a special place, and I can guarantee you that if, if you spend a few days there, uh, that you you would feel uh, very much worth the time. Uh, I have several friends who have taken the river tours, the, the river trips, where mm -hmm. they do yes. Prague, Vienna, Budapest, and they are come back glowing about because they expect Prague and Vienna <laughs> to be what they are, and are amazed at how wonderful. In fact, the Mission Impossible movie that I just saw a couple of days ago, I think it's right. Yeah, I, uh, yes. Um, in Budapest, in your youth, um, did you go to um, 
a Jewish school. Well, uh, let me explain that very quickly. The first four years was a regular elementary school mm -hmm. uh, with everybody else. Then there is a, uh, t um, an, an eight-year school, like a lycée, like a gymnasium, like a, uh, a, a, a prep school where you have to stay there for eight years. That's the school that was available uh, in my neighborhood, uh, not only to Jewish kids, although uh, the majority were Jewish kids because it, uh, it, it had a synagogue in the building itself. And the building itself was an unbelievable marble inside, I mean inside, the steps and the floors were marble and, and the synagogue was beautiful and big and that's where I sat in the choir and, and made money from uh, guessing how much uh, <laughs> some, some of the rich uh, were going to give. Uh, but that's an eight year school and it's probably the most difficult school outside of France and where you have schools in Paris that you know are very hard and uh, this school demanded things like, you know, you learning Latin, German, uh, and, and then choose between French and English, and, uh, and, and then and there's an eight-year exam. At the end of eight years, you sit in front of the whole faculty, even the people that you never had as a, as a teacher, and you have to write an essay ahead of time that you hand in, and then based on the essay, they ask questions, or oh, the whole faculty from this one person in, in the middle can ask all the questions that they want to. And depending on that, you get the, uh, the uh, passing or whatever grade that you, and there are some people who get, who, who get through beautifully and, and they were always university graduates afterwards. That's every, everyone that came out of there, okay? All right, so the, the therefore, uh, at that time, culturally speaking, the Jews in Budapest and in your neighborhood felt they were, they were Hungarians and felt assimilated. That they, they, uh, I guess what, what I'm getting at is how extraordinary the, and the incremental progress of, of um, isolating a group of people and how that started to come down I in your community. To, I don't want to go too far with saying that there was a human kind of uh, situation in which the Jews fit in perfectly well. I was never really aware of being a Jew okay. as a kid, and I left uh, Budapest when I was 16. I was never made aware of, of Jewishness in a personal kind of way, okay? But that doesn't mean that Hungary is not one of the worst places for anti-Semitism in the people. And it's because the people, like uh, in, in many other cases you can find, the people have been exploited by an aristocracy who owned the land for hundreds of years, Hungary was a, fe a feudal state before uh, uh, some clarification that took place in the 1860s. Uh, so what, what happens in an aristocracy is that you have a lot of poor, uneducated peasants. They are, they are not farmers. In, in, in Hungary there are no farmers. There are peasants, people who work on somebody else's land and work their head off. And the, and the girls who grow up in a family like that, they escape as soon as they can to get to the city, Budapest, or any other city where they can work for a family as a, as a, a maid, someone who washes the floors, or does the cooking, or, or goes shopping and that kind of thing. Uh, during the, during this, uh, st the, the, the last few months of the, of the war, I was living in a safe house that was established by Raoul Wallenberg, and I had to, one day I had to go to a, a bakery because I wasn't getting any food from my mother anymore, and I took a tremendous chance. I ended up in, a, in an empty movie house, and next to me was a girl, a little blonde girl, about 16 years old, who had been one of those cases, running away from his, her, her village, ending up with a family, and she told me her story. She was sitting there alone in an empty cold, cold black movie house that I escaped to from the bakery that I had to go to. And I sat next to her and for an hour and a half while my bread was being baked, she told me the story of what they did to her in that family and how they treated her and that she was trying to escape from them. And this is the story that most of them went through. And not every family mistreated the maids, but, but the maids were exposed to that kind of thing. And that's the story of, uh, you know, the, the social setting in a way 
that, that, uh, that you have to know about. There is, and, and, and the most famous thing about Hungarian anti-Semitism is the blood libel. And I think there are very few people that are able now to, to tell the story of the blood libel. It happened in the 1870s that a small town to the east of Budapest, uh, perhaps uh, 100 miles or over to the east, uh, in a small town there was a rabbi with his son and uh, the usual population of peasants. And a girl uh, was, was drowned or killed in the river, another river, not the Danube, another river. And the rabbi was accused of having killed the girl in front of his congregation and taken her blood in order to make matzo. Matzes. This was this was the story among anti-Semite, anti-Semitic peasants about the Jews that they needed the the blood of a Christian virgin in order to make the bread, the the unleavened bread, the matzo, and they accused the rabbi of doing that, and they claimed that his son saw him do it, and that his son testified by that he looked through the keyhole of the of the synagogue where there is this rising area that I've told you about before that he said my, his father was up there and he killed the girl, took her blood, and then they used the blood to make matzo. This is a boy testifying against his father. And for if, if nothing else had happened, his father, the, the rabbi, would have been punished with death and, and, and the usual kind of pogrom would have taken place among the Jews. But there was a great a great savior lawyer in Budapest who was not Jewish. And I can give you his name, it doesn't mean anything, you can look him up, E-O-T-V-O-S, Utvush, is the way the Hungarians pronounce his name. There are umlauts on the, on, 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 on the two O's, okay, Utvush. Anyway, he heard about this case, about how <coughs> his son testified against his father, and he couldn't believe it. He went to the town, to this little town, and he looked over the situation, and after he looked at the, uh, the synagogue and the, the outlay of, the, of everything, the keyhole, the, the place that the boy talked about, etc., et and he questioned other people. He found out that the son had been uh, intimidated, beaten, uh, bribed with anything and everything to testify against his father. And so he investigated, and then there came a courtroom. In front of a judge, he said, I want everyone in this courtroom, including the judge, the jury, uh, if there's a jury, uh, whatever people, come with me and let's go to the synagogue. I want to show you something and then I want you to make a judgment. He took them to the synagogue. He made them bend down to the keyhole <coughs> and guess what? The keyhole did not look at the center of the synagogue where that area was where his father was supposed to have killed the girl. You couldn't see that area from the keyhole. A little a, a little problem in, in the facts. And then everybody could see what, what a story had been made up against the rabbi. He was obviously acquitted and the boy, the boy confessed how much he was intimidated, beaten and everything else. And that's why he, that, that's why he would testify against his father. This blood libel is a basic story of the Hungarian attitude towards the Jew. Okay, because they are so they are so kept down by they were, and even now, I mean, the majority of the Hungarian Jew, the Hungarians are <laughs> suffering from a poor economy, a, a horrible economy, and there's a right wing movement taking over the parliament in Hungary. You can read about it, and and it's it's a it's a kind of an eternal cycle that that takes place because of uh, the state of the, 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 the country. The country is restricted to agricultural work. And, and whatever industrial work was, was created was done by the Jews. By, and built, the, the factories were, were built by the Jews. And they are the ones that were killed and, 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 and chased away. And Hungary was back to nowhere. And this is a story that you can go from place to place in, in Eastern Europe and find it in quite a few places. Although the blood libel is a special Hungarian thing. <sighs> As a Holocaust survivor, you're talking about you want to make a fool out of Hitler. 
Yeah. What was your feeling when you saw the play or the movie The Producers, where they're doing springtime for Hitler and they're <laughs> making fun of it? Well, uh, uh, that, that was tremendously pleasing. Uh, I mean, anything that uh, Mel Brooks does has, <laughs> has something to it. Uh, uh, I don't have to tell you. Uh, I, it, it's not, I, I don't think I can make a, a complete full, I, I, I'm making a small time thief. Not a full man so much, but a small time thief. Someone who should have learned how, how to become a second floor <coughs> man and, and steal the, 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 the little things that he wanted to, to steal to keep his own poor life going instead of killing a whole people and making a whole people into fools, the Germans. Uh, by making them believe that they could have an empire that would last for a thousand years <laughs> and, and, and then be finished in 12. Uh, so, that's... Let me just say one yes, thing. Please, please don't, don't worry about I, I think it is understandable why you want to um, minimize um, the totality of evil that Hitler represented. At the same time, the, the, the full scale of what Hitler did represent must, should never be forgotten. No. And he was, let, let me finish for just sure. for a moment. He was incredibly misled in many respects. I read just recently that his uh, embassy in, uh, in Washington was um, sending back uh, reports on what the Americans were up to. And this is before he declared, before war was declared. And his, argue, his attitude towards the United States was that what are the Americans? Uh, they are, they're Betty Grable, uh, they are uh, they, they're baseball players, they can't do anything. Um, it was, in those respects, he was fundamentally foolish and misled. But the totality of evil that he did represent, I mean, just last week in the Wall Street Journal, there was a review of five or six books uh, that uh, we, we called the Holocaust. And uh, one man who had served as a, a Sunderkommando uh, the Jews who were in charge of, of, the, of, the, of the camps doing the work of the Nazis. Uh, he had been taken in with his sister one day in early 1942. And uh, within hours, he found her dress on a pile. Because he was a Sonder commando, so he had some special uh, rights and roles uh, to, to perform. He saw her, her dress. Within hours, she was killed. Six million. I mean, it's just an incredible uh, scale of violence. But let me just say one last thing. When we talk about the, uh, the blood libel, I read recently again in the Wall Street Journal that um, the, the book, which has been proven many times to be a forgery, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, yeah. it's on the bestseller list in the Middle East. You walk into the bookstores in Cairo, in Baghdad, in Syria, like and you can find copies of that book, and it's still being believed. I'd like to add Mein Kampf. Oh, yes. It's being republished, yes, and yes, it's being republished with annotations mm -hmm. uh, for scholars <laughs> in Arabic. <laughs> yeah. I would like to say something about this, which is in Europe right now, the right wing is getting elected or getting a lot of votes That's right. throughout many countries. And part of the reason that they are being elected is because the fear of Arabs. So let us be careful and not start feeling towards Arabs the way people felt towards Jews or the way people felt towards blacks or anything. Let us be very careful about this because the line is very thin and it's very scary. Yeah, and, 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 Hit right. and, and Hitler came to power in a so-called democracy. Okay, whether we want to think that it was a democracy or not, but it was a democracy. So let us be careful because we live in a democracy, and a lot of European countries live in a democracy. So we better think about our sentiments of, of anger towards certain people and keep it. Well, of course, coming back from Paris, as you have just done, 
Uh, the case against the Arabs is much stronger there. It's, it's strong there, but it's not just there. It's strong in Holland, it's strong in Germany, yeah. it's strong in a lot of places right now. And it's yes. awful. Mm -hmm. And it makes a rise of people that are going to put everybody out of commission because you're this or that. or And you know, the Jews were not the only one that got wiped out, the gypsies got wiped out, the homosexuals got wiped out. I should have said that. Christians and, and, and you know, a lot of people got wiped out I should have said that. during the, this moment in history, so. Especially the gypsies and the homosexuals, mm -hmm. definitely a part of the deal. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I don't want to uh, stop answering questions. Any question, any comment, any remark that you would like to make, please, you know, go ahead, yes. Years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Auschwitz and Birkenau. To do what? I'm sorry. To, I had the opportunity to visit Auschwitz oh. and Birkenau. And until your speech tonight, I don't know what it was about Auschwitz. I couldn't put into words what I did not like about it. And it wasn't um, a showing of what Hitler did. You said it was almost like a praise of what he did with the way things were shown there. After we left Auschwitz, we went over to Birkenau, which was basically an empty camp. You could go, you could touch the death wagon, you could touch the beds these people were forced to sleep in. It was much, much more moving. Um, to me, Auschwitz was touristy was the best word I could go for. But what you told me tonight was what I got out of that and what I didn't like about Auschwitz. It was almost praise to Hitler. You see, I think uh, humanity, we, we are living through an age, an, an age when it's very easy to confuse uh, popular, not popularity, but, but uh, the popularizing instinct of media that will popularize anything that comes along that you can focus people's eyes on. It doesn't matter what. And, uh, su and suddenly a, uh, a horrible uh, criminal, you know. Let me give you an example of what happened in Hungary as far as, you know, to make you remember never to, never to, to think that there was something easy about the Germans. They moved into Hungary on March 19, 1944. Until then, the Hungarians were German allies and fought with them against the Russians in Russia lost a lot of people and so forth. Then, on March 19, the Germans found out that the Hungarians began to believe that the war was lost, like the Romanians had done, and joined the Allies. And they were afraid that the Hungarians would go over to the Allies. So they invaded Hungary, they occupied Budapest, and within uh, two months, they shipped 450,000 Jews from the small villages of the eastern part of Hungary, the kind of place that if you remember seeing uh, Fiddler on the Roof, remember the shtetls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the people from there were very easy pickings because they could be packed into a train in a half a day and gone to, to Auschwitz, okay? And uh, so when you have killed 450,000 in two months, but we in Budapest were not touched because uh, the publicity to the rest of the world and to the leader of Hungary at that time, who was a former admiral of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, he, he had a kind of a feeling that he was responsible for holding on to the Jews of Budapest, which is what happens, I happen to be living in. And so we went through months after that of not being bothered and so forth. And so I, I, I'm trying to say, if, if, you are, if you are aware at all of what kinds of things happen, there's no chance that you would give Hitler an easy out or anything. I'm just trying to, to see to it that his real, that his real second rateness, or or worse, becomes clear to people. And you know, he, and and he was not second rate in the sense of being able to make a rabble rousing uh, speech to a, a, a group of tea partiers or something. You know, he he. And, and, and he could uh, exploit all of that. Uh, but as far as being a really a, a member of the historical elite in some way because of the number of things that he did, horrible as they might be, I don't want him to have the credit. And I don't want him, if I know he's not aware, he's not able to, 
but I, even spiritually speaking, I don't want to see the Jewish people forget who they are and who they were and what they have given, what they have created. It, it's an incredible thing, but because of the destruction that was caused among them by the Nazis, you remember only the destruction and not the creation. And that's what I'm trying to correct. Because the creation is, is obvious. All you have to do is look, just look at the evidence. And, uh, you know, but at the same time, sometimes the Jews go too far. You know, just they're, 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 they're own, they're human. I'm not saying that they are chosen people or that they are special people. And they are the first ones to deny that. But there are, you know, stories about people and so on. They have made just as many mistakes as anybody else. And they have to watch that. You can see what's happening in Israel. They could be destroyed any day, the whole thing. So, I, but I, I really, I try to explain what I'm really after. Uh, I just don't like a cheap little uh, Austrian who was without talent and without being able to, not being able to paint enough to sell one. Did you see his artwork? What? Did you ever see his artwork? No. I went to an exhibit of this watercolors. And um, they were they were not bad. They were very mediocre, actually. Oh, they, were, they not were not bad, but they, but were, they were, not were very not bad. mediocre. Mediocre. <laughs> mediocre, as opposed to real bad. They were just mediocre. I go for that. I, I, I like that. His whole life is mediocre. <laughs> and and, and I, you know, I, I don't want to condemn him to saying that he was the most evil person. Because giving him credit for being the most evil already raises him to something that that's too much. <coughs> See, nothing, he's nothing most. He's maybe the most mediocre person, yes. Most mediocre. That's, that's, a, that's a great record to have. <laughs> given, given the circumstances that were going on in Germany at the time, if it wasn't Hitler, do you believe it would have been someone else? Uh, 1930s, you mean? The yeah. late, third, late 20s and so on? Uh, it depends on uh, whether they would have the rhetorical skills. Uh, he, he obviously was able, was, had hung around in the, in the uh, battlefields of uh, France and uh, so forth, the First World War. He was a corporal and, uh, you know, he hung around enough to know what uh, his kind of people listened to and what, what kind of uh, cliches and stuff he could throw at them that would work. And then, of course, there was the natural um, prejudice, the natural hatred. Uh, the natural envy, especially envy. People forget, they don't talk about envy enough. I mean, the Jews were the most envied uh, small minority that you can imagine. They, they seem to pull out a, uh, a factory out of nothing and, and, and become un, you know, uh, so important that the, the regent of Hungary, whose name was Nicholas Horty, and who was a former admiral of the he played bridge with all the uh, Jewish bankers and uh, the industry owners up in the castle during the war. While the Germans were coming in, he was still playing bridge with them. And he was going to see to it that they are not hurt <laughs> because, because the, the whole Hungarian economy depended on the Jews that owned the factories and the banks. That's the situation. Uh, maybe in some of the other countries it wasn't quite so uh, one-sided. But that's, that's part of the story, always. Well, I, I think that um, it's in our DNA, if, if I can use that word, to, uh, to um, discriminate against the other person. As for the, the that, that there is envy, that's also part of human nature. Yes. And how to keep that in check is what I, am, I, I think I hear from you. Well, it's one thing about you keeping know. it in check, keeping it in check, but it's another is to exploit it. Well, it, yeah, and that's all been very nicely uh, reiterated from several people here. Uh, that it's all still happening. There are um, perhaps people not as theatrical as Hitler, but it is happening in the world right now, as we speak. And because of the uh, you know, and, and as Americans, we have our own 
shameful history regarding um, the other, the person with black skin. And uh, I mean, there are people now, we have a, a president who is a man of color, and the man with the orange hair is impugning that he's not an American, he was not born here. I mean, just this, he, there's a figure, figure who's very theatrical and in um, and, and trying to, to villainize someone um, because of um, basically um, the color of the skin. So I, I, I don't think it's going to end either. And to remember and to honor um, is, is what I'm hearing from you. And um, I guess to have heart, as you say, also. Well, I, I have to tell you, uh, your sketch is wonderful, yeah. uh, the whole thing. And I have to just admit that I come across to myself as uh, a temporary uh, uh, attempt to, to set some records straight uh, that ha I think have been created sort of unthinkingly about the, uh, the great bravery of the German soldier, uh, blah, 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 all of that stuff. Uh, and um, not to mention then uh, things that Hitler supposedly achieved with his uh, great willpower and, and, and magnetism and I, I know a, a woman who's 87 years old in, Lund in, in uh, Boston. She's an endocrinologist, a scientist, an endocrinologist, who is still going from hospital to hospital to do her work on the, uh, in, in, in the laboratory because she's a specialist in this, in this field. She was born in Berlin, and in 1936, when the German Olympics, the Berlin Olympics were to take place, she was a member of the German um, gymnastics team. She was such a gymnast at the age of nine uh, that she was just admired by all of them. And they elected her to be a member of the team in the Olympics. The trouble was she was Jewish. She was nine years old, a little girl who was so great, but she was Jewish. And, and the, the order came down, no Jews on the German team. Uh, what can I tell you? Uh, a, a story like that, uh, much greater tragedies have happened and so forth. And, and, and if I told you the whole story, you would, you would see, uh, you would get one version of the kinds of stories that, that you can hear. Some people who sat on the Siberian Express and got through the whole German thing and Poland and then into Russia and then travel all the way to Siberia and then end up in Shanghai and survive the war <laughs> thanks to the Japanese. I mean, you know, there are unbelievable stories. And I know some people personally who have done that. But with her, her family, her father was a prominent lawyer and he decided right after 1938 when the uh, this, uh, Kristallnacht uh, took place, that he would move his family to England and he, they, they somehow bribed their way through to uh, Amsterdam and from Amsterdam to London. And then comes the unbelievable part of the story and she's still here to tell you. And she's in Boston to tell you. Uh, in, in, in London they decided to go to Australia in 1941. And this is the time of the U-boats uh, sinking everything around England and the Atlantic and everywhere else. They went through Gibraltar with a ship, a, 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 a common everyday ship, through Gibraltar, through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal into the Indian Ocean. They made it to Sydney, and that's where she began eventually to study uh, medicine. And then she went to England after the war was over and finished her work in medicine, became an endocrinologist, and she's still working. And she, she's, she was in the Boston Globe about a year ago with her picture standing in front of a, uh, a microphone and telling her story to a crowd of people. I mean, I don't know what to tell you, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's... Would you tell us how you escaped the fate of your members of your family? How did you escape the same fate that befell your uh, some of the members of your family? Sure, I have, I have a couple of you know real in, in, incidents where you can see my my life hanging in the uh, you know the, the possibility. But first of all, uh, 
right after the invasion by the Germans in March 19, 19, March 19 of 1944. And we were left alone for the whole summer because all they did was they moved Jews into Jewish buildings in Budapest. They picked up 2,600 buildings. So we lived in those buildings. Ours happened to be picked, so we didn't have to move, but four people moved in with us from the family. Anyway, it was a very easy summer. I'm not going to deal with that. Uh, uh, the incidents that began to happen where your life was at, at stake, uh, my mother found Raoul Wallenberg and uh, <coughs> he put me into a safe house, as they called it. There was a Swedish writ on the outside saying no, no unpermitted uh, un, uh, personnel can enter and so forth. So they put me into that. It was right on the Danube. I could look down on this scene. I, I, I couldn't see the shoes, but I, I could see people being led along the Danube. Um, my mother put me in there, and they lived on Christian papers in a uh, Christian building. Tremendous gamble that they took. She brought me food every two or three days. And then one day when she didn't bring me food for several days, and I was very hungry, I was looking for some way to get some food. Because one thing you got in the safe house was a bunk to sleep in, but no food. You had to have your own food. And I was living in a family, uh, uh, in, in an apartment that a family lived in. They had their own flour, they, were, they had their own pasta, and they had their own food, and they made their own bread and baked it in the oven in, the, in, in this apartment. So I was there to smell the, the bread being baked, but I couldn't have any, because they had enough of a family to want all the food they could have. So I was gone for two or three days without food, and suddenly I got a break. <coughs> their oven broke down, but they had the bread ready to be baked, and they couldn't bake it. So I volunteered, taking my life in my hands, because I was not supposed to be in the streets, uh, to take the bread to a bakery. <coughs> and I knew a bakery that was about a block, two, two blocks and a half away. So I took the bread, they agreed to give me some of the bread, and that's all I did it for, because I was not going to, you know, go without food. I had to have something. So I took the bread with the dish like this in front of me, and I, I thought I was there free, two blocks away, and then turned to the right, and there was the baker in the middle of the block with a window as long as that wall. Okay, you, you know how big bakeries can be. And I got, uh, there was a mob of uh, 50 to 60 people, all of them with a dish in their arm, waiting to get into the bakery to have bread baked. Just as I made the turn behind me, up comes a truck, and I can see who's jumping off the truck. Guess what? The green, gray uniforms with uh, machine guns and everything. And these were German soldiers, and they started to come towards the same mob of people as I was. I was trying to hurry up to get there and get lost in the middle. And I, I thought that would be you know, one way to get away. But on the other end of the block, the same kind of a truck stopped, and, and the same soldiers jumped off that truck and they started coming towards the uh, bakery from that angle. So two sides, a trap was closing, and I was in the middle with the, with the group of people, with all of them with bread. So it was a question of how long we could survive. The Germans were not going to let us uh, go in there and bake bread, you know. And as, guess what happened? As they were coming closer and closer, I should have said that all this time that I was walking through the streets, bombs were exploding everywhere, all because the Russians were getting into the suburbs, and not only that, but there were, Amer there were American bombs bombing too, the Germans. And so there was a war going on, at this a full, full strength war. And just as uh, I'm, let, I'm getting lost in the crowd, and the Germans are on two sides, <laughs> a bomb hits the building, a six-story building, apartment building across the street from, just across from the bakery. And it comes down like a, like, like, you know, powder, and, and, and all over the people standing there, a lot of them immediately killed, hit, hurt. For some reason, I was close enough to the, to the window of the bakery, hiding in the crowd, which is what all I wanted to do, and the cover on the thing was still there. And uh, suddenly there was no window, it had blown out, and the people around me were crying, you know, in their suffering, and the Germans were running back to the truck. Uh, some of them got killed, but those that didn't were making it back to the trucks. And I jumped over the uh, little wall that was in the front of the bakery where the window had been sitting. I jumped over there into the bakery, 
I, I don't know what made <coughs> me do these things. Let me tell you something. I went through this, it, 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 you can call it unconscious or whatever, but I was, I was in the bakery. I had the bread in my hand. I saw this one face behind one counter. I went over to him and put it down in front. And I said, bake it in Hungarian. And, and with that, I kept walking because I could see a corridor that was going through the bakery into the back. And all, what I had in mind was to get out of the bakery and get into the next block and get away from the German trucks and so forth and, and get back to the building. But instead of uh, finding a, 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 another block, it was a courtyard. And you, uh, you remember uh, European buildings from the uh, early 20th century. They were built around a courtyard of and There would be bushes and trees and so forth in the middle of the courtyard. But if you wanted to go into an apartment, you had to go up to a, a, gang, a, a floor that would be surrounded by a gangway. Okay, and the apartment doors would open from the inside, from the courtyard side. Okay, there were no doors otherwise to get into the apartment. And so I had no way out. I couldn't find a door that led out to the next block. And instead of going there, I, I saw this one door that was very narrow and didn't have a handle on it. But it was right across from the bakery, under the, the, the first floor. And I went over to it, and I thought I would have some hope of opening it. And somehow or other, I don't know how, I scratched it open with my nails. And it turned out to be a a door, all black, very dark, uh, very uh, uh, dull paint. The kind of door that now I recognize that you see in movies here. On the inside they have a sign that says exit. But no, no, in, no entrance, as you know. Because otherwise people would come in and see the movie without a ticket. I got in by scratching it open. And at first all I could see was this huge black space no lights or anything, and I could see a few seats in front of me in rows, okay? And then I could see better because the door got open. I could see that there were many seats and many rows. It was a movie house, empty, dark, except for one head, about three rows ahead of me, scooched down into the seat, a little blonde-headed girl. And she was one of those girls that I told you about earlier, the, the, the servants who came up to Budapest to work. And she immediately started to tell me, she was crying her head off. She put her head very happily on my shoulder and tried to tell me her story. And it was simply that they mistreated her and that she was trying to escape from them, the family that had, had hired her. And so she told me her story. It took a little while and told him. I told her where I was coming from, what I was escaping from, and so forth. By the time it was, that was an hour and a half later. And then I had the nerve to say to her, I'm sorry, but I have to go get the bread. <laughs> and, and she had no idea of uh, what I was talking about, but she had to let me go. And I never saw her again. And I got back to the bakery the same way as I had come. And guess what? There was the dish on the counter where I had left it, but the bread was baked. Mm -hmm. It was done. And I grabbed it, it was hot, and I hugged it to myself, and I went out, and I looked around and see, no, no problem. So a bomb hit a building, and it happened to be just in time for me, so I could get some bread. <coughs> How do you explain such a thing, you know? But it happened to me. You were 16 at the time? I'm sorry? You were 16 at yes. the time? Yes. This is 1944, I was born in 28. Uh, this, this is the most dramatic aspect of, my, of an escape that I had uh, in terms of. But then came the end of the year, uh, the last couple of days of December, when I went looking for my mother, my grandmother, an aunt, and a cousin, my aunt's daughter, who lived in an apartment, a Christian building that was under false papers. Christian papers, which was very, very dangerous. And they tried to get me to live there, but I couldn't make it. I, I, I wanted to stay in a safe house. And the reason they did it, because they could buy food. Jews couldn't go out to buy food. <coughs> Whenever, and in the ghetto, there was no food. The ghetto had about 100,000 people in it. This was outside the ghetto. It was surrounded by Christians. It was surrounded by uh, some businesses that had food for sale. And, and they took a chance, and it was probably my aunt Olga 
which was a real gambler. <coughs> and she got them involved in getting these papers that were Christian papers. I finally didn't hear from them for several days and I began to worry and I got a chance to get into the building area that they lived in and I escaped from my group that I was in because we were going to pick up uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the stuff on the roads because the traffic was not able to get through. The bombing has destroyed the streets. And so I escaped from them and here I am walking down a dark street. It's, it's about 6 or 7 o'clock. Uh, a late December night, the snow, about a foot of snow covering the streets. And I'm walking on a downtown, very, uh, very high class uh, street that, the, uh, uh, that, that they had at time there. And, and I'm, as I'm walking down, I'm trying to melt into the building that I don't want to be seen. I can see that people are being arrested everywhere. So I try to not be seen. But because I was so careful to uh, melt away. I didn't keep my eyes open as to what's ahead. And right in the middle of this wide avenue that I was on, here's this huge gendarme. And, and I, those of you that have not lived in Europe, you don't know that gendarmes are, they pretty much have the uh, reputation of uh, American state policemen, kind of, kind of uh, uh, very, very hard-nosed people. And the gendarmes were very much a, s scary to, to Jews. And he was standing in the middle of this road, this wide avenue. And I, across from him, I could see a, a, a door that kept opening. And behind the door, I could see a whole beehive of people that looked very Jewish and very scary. And I could see that people were being sent over there to behind that door. And I, I didn't want to be sent over. So when I, when I kept going and I didn't see the gendarme, I really took my, my life in my hands. He saw me and he motioned for me to come over to him. And let me tell you something. This was the most uh, uh, direct participation that I had in my survival. Because <coughs> I had to make my way across the half of the road to him as he was calling me. And while I was going, I was holding on to a briefcase that had a little piece of dry bread in it that was a leftover from the bread that I got from the bakery. And I was still carrying it with me just in case I needed something to chew on. So I had that little piece of dry bread in it and it was under my arm. And as I was walking over to him, I was trying to come up with a story. What am I going to tell him? Because I knew what he was about. I could see the door across the way. So as, as soon as I was within hearing of him, I began to talk. I said, look, and I took the briefcase and I showed him. Look at this piece of bread. This is, I'm taking this to my mother and she's in that building. She's sick. She has nothing to eat. I'm taking this to her so that she will have something to eat. And this seven footer with the, with, with, with the, uh, the those, those uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, no, they're black. They're black and they're, black and they're yeah, high. Yeah, they, yeah. You, you can stick them into your head, into your cap. And, and he was standing there, and he had black boots on, and, and a black coat that went down to his uh, to his out, uh, uh, his ankles. And and he looked me over. He he looked me up and down. He listened to the story about the bread, and he looked me up and down. And then he looked me in the eye. He had big black eyes. He had a mustache that was like this. It came out to here. And how can I tell you? He had to be painted. Somebody should have seen him that can paint someone like that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he looked me over again, and then he, he said, run. <laughs> Just like that. He believed my story. And the fact is that most of it was true, because I was pointing at a building that my mother actually was in with the three others that were, spoke, that were with her on Christian papers. So I wasn't completely lying, that, you know, but, but I told him that story. So he said, run. And I, I couldn't believe it, but I, I ran. And I just ran and, and got away from him. And later on, when I became uh, more uh, sophisticated, uh, sort of thinker in the 60s and the 70s, I thought what an irony that he actually allowed me to go and find out what happened to my mother, that I would never have found out, that I would never have had to suffer through trying to imagine what happened and how it happened to her. But when, when I got to the building, 
The superintendent was just coming up from the basement. And by the way, you should know that during that bombing period of the last month, two, two months of the war, everybody was in the basement, living, in the, sleeping in the basement, eating in the basement. That's it. They couldn't go up. There was no. Ch you couldn't take a chance on being up in, in the building. So. From the basement, up comes this uh, superintendent, and he comes over to me and says, what, what are you looking for? I told him the family's name. And, and he was actually sympathetic, because he said that uh, he, they were picked up last night by a truck, and, and they're gone. And he said, the person that betrayed them is the same one that sold them the papers. Mm -hmm. He knew. I never found out who the person was. My brother and I went all over trying to find out after the war was over. And we couldn't find out who, who sold them the paper and who betrayed them and all of that. But that's how I lost my family. My father was already gone because of 1942. They took him to the Ukraine. And in the Ukraine, they, they destroyed people. They, they didn't give them food and shelter and so forth. So I lost my family that way. And then I, my, my brother was still missing. He was five years older than I. He graduated with honors from that, store, that uh, school that I mentioned to you. And uh, he survived in a brick kiln outside of Vienna. A brick kiln was somehow available to crawl into. After having marched them, he was one of a group of, of young men, about 23, 25 years old. They marched them from Yugoslavia through Romania, through Czechoslovakia, down to Vienna. That was a Hungarian officer that took him, and he told him, if you behave, you'll survive. And if you follow my rules, you will survive this. And then they got to Vienna, the war was almost over, and he let them go. Everybody found a place to hide. My brother crawled into a brick kiln that was not being used. That was the best place he could find for himself. But there was no food, and somehow someone who didn't know him or knew him, but he told me later, Someone brought him water. From time to time, they brought him water. And in the kiln, he was in there for two weeks or something, on nothing but water. And that the water helped him survive, even though he became sick with typhus. And when he came home to Budapest, and somebody yelled up into my apartment building, uh, that Bundy is here, Bundy was his name. And so I ran down, and he could hardly walk. He was covered with uh, this kind of sores that you get from typhus in some cases. And so I had to put oil over his, over his body for two weeks to, to help him with the, with the itching and everything else that went on. And that was my brother. He stayed in Hungary. I said, I'm leaving Europe. He, a scholar of Marx, stayed in Hungary. He became a, a ghost writer for the, for the political system in Hungary. Okay, he had an apartment on the Danube, not not where the shoes were, but in another area, where you could see the whole the whole beautiful scene of of Buddha and and the, the bridges and the Danube. And when I went there to see him, I, I went out on the balcony of this fantastic apartment that the government gave him, and right under under the apartment on the Danube there was a Russian tourist boat. They came from Vienna and went all the way to the Black Sea. But on the top deck of the tourist boat, I don't know why I'm telling you this, it's just because of the sights that you run into, there was a chessboard on the whole, the whole board, the whole top deck was painted into a chess, a chessboard. And they had people playing the pieces. <laughs> Actually, under the balcony, I, I could watch the moves that they were making, you know. And uh, so anyway, my brother survived. He stayed in Hungary. He just died last year at the age of 87. And uh, he was a ghost writer, and he wrote uh, about Marx, and he, you know, he, he, he was a believer. And he stayed there. He, he was not uh, the way I was. I, I, I wanted to have nothing to do with Europe anymore when I was 16. So that's how I got away. And, that, and so the, the dangers that I went through have, have, have to do a lot with luck. I could tell you a couple of other stories, but, you know, I, I, I don't think I can make a stay for that. But basically, I, I, I was just lucky in, in most cases. I have to give credit. I had an aunt, however, that I have to tell you about. At one point, 
the, the Nazis took me out to an island in the Danube. That is the biggest island in the Budapest area, south of Budapest. And it's full of industrial development, mostly built by a guy called Weiss Manfred, a uh, Hungarian Jewish uh, industrialist. And he was one of the best friends of the region. Anyway, on that island, they made us, uh, uh, me and my uncle, we were first out there to dig ditches against the Russian tanks. That was the idea. They, they took us away from our family in, in October. And we dug ditches for a while, and then, then they took us to this island, and we found about 20,000 men sitting in the mud. It was raining all the time. This was November 1944. And these 20,000 men were all Jewish, and they were all sitting there with their heads down, looking in the puddle behind their knees, and sitting and sitting and sitting. I, we sat there together with them for three days, and there was nothing else to do except to look at the puddles. And that's what these poor men were doing. And so suddenly, in the middle of such an impossible situation, because I could see, we could see a train coming in from the north on the right side, being filled up with some of the men, with the men from the island, and then the train went off. On the other side of the island, on the other uh, shore, there were streetcars coming up from the south, going north, and they were going into the city, taking people who were going to work. They were suburbanites. And uh, so there were the trains going towards Austria and the other trains going towards Budapest. And my uncle and I sat there, and we didn't know what else to do except sit there with those 20,000 who knew what was coming. And suddenly I heard this voice calling out a name and keep start coming closer. And it was my uncle's last name, his family name, Hayosh. And I said to him, I, I, I said, your, your name is being called. And, and you know, he was surprised he didn't, he didn't hear it. So we got up, both of us, and we called the, the soldier who was calling out a name. And we called him over. He came over. He said, come on, follow me. So we followed him. He took us to a little hut that was just a few steps away, basically, from this large group that was sitting there. And he took us to a hut, and in the hut there's a desk, and behind the desk there's a, an officer in a pretty good-looking uniform. And he doesn't say anything. He looks us both over, and he looks at my uncle, who was 55 years old, and he says to him, where did you find that woman? This is what he said to him in, in Hungarian. And my uncle almost fainted. He thought that he had done something with a woman. He didn't know what, he, what the man was referring to. And he kept asking, Red, I said to my uncle, it's your wife. He wants to know about Aunt Marishka, who was one of my two aunts. I had Olga, who was a real gambler. Marishka was a real queen. I, I have a picture of her in this book from 19... At the age when, when he was set, she was 75 years old in Australia. After the war, they went to Australia, she and her family, two kids and her husband and herself. She's sitting in a chair with her legs crossed. You never saw better legs <laughs> than a 75 year old, let me tell you. And she was a queen in every other way because she, I mean, we listened to her in the family and she was, she was just very impressive, that kind of a person. And this is what the uh, officer wanted. Where did you find such a woman? He yelled at my uncle. And my uncle was scared to death. He couldn't. He said, we got married in 1919. <laughs> That's not the question. Where did you find her? You know, and he couldn't answer. So finally, the officer gave up. And he said to the soldier who brought us in, take him out that way. And so he pointed towards the streetcars. Guess what? Out of 20,000, my uncle and I were taken to a streetcar to go back into the city and find our families. And my uncle's wife, Aunt Marishka, and my mother, and my grandmother, and a cousin, they were still living in a building that we could find them in. How close can you get, you know? But that was, and the reason, that's why I say, I hope women become the heads of our government. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had no experience with women, anything but their courage, they're, 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 you know, they, 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 had, they had the mind to, to see through what was going on and to do things. And it's obviously ridiculous. I, I don't know why. I, 
But I feel that way. I really feel that way. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.